We are in the Hebraic month of Heshvan. It is also called Mar Heshvan, and it is known as the month of bitterness. Why is that? Because the previous month is Tishri, where there's so many beautiful festivals that are celebrated. And yet in this month, there is not even one festival to celebrate. Another hint about this month is that the Mazel, or the constellation in the sky during this month, of Heshvan, Mar Heshvan, is the constellation Scorpio or Scorpion. And it, if you really do a word study on that, you're going to see that it, the word is a crab, and the uh, derivative of that is of crab, which is the father of bitterness. So this month is known as a bitter month. I want to encourage you that if there are any bitter roots in your life, anything that you have not dealt with, unforgiveness that you've carried from year to year, and there's a coldness in your heart, there is an indifference in your heart, you don't have the passion for Christ that you used to have, or perhaps you've never had a passion for the Lord or a zeal for the Lord. We are to be zealous, the scripture says, for good works. And Jesus, he was a zealous person. Uh, the zeal of the house of the Lord w was so powerful, it consumed him. And we are to be like that. We are to have that beautiful longing to serve the Lord, to love the Lord, and to serve people. But bitterness is going to cause you to be very, very lack in your passion for God. So as we're looking at this month and we're looking at the scorp scorpion in the sky, it's a message from God that we should not allow the coldness of this month. October, characteristically, it, it goes, into, goes into the winter months. The nights get colder. Scorpions are known to bite at night. Uh, and one of the reasons why is you don't, know they're around uh, and so you can uh, actually provoke a scorpion not even know that you're provoking it because it's in the night and so many times they will bite their victims at night uh, and as we see that it's an unexpected sting it, it would it, it causes great upheaval in 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 that person's life so the devil moves that same way he is very uh, divisive in his ways. He knows how to attack people. And the element of, su of surprise goes in his favor. We don't expect an attack from the enemy. We don't expect a trial. We fall into a trial without expecting it. And it can happen uh, during night seasons of our life, the dark nights of our soul, when we go through challenges, when we go through even tragedies, this is what we have to guard against. And if bitterness has become a part of our life because of a past tragedy or challenge that you've gotten stuck in, you, you haven't been able to move through it, this is the month that you need to really reach out to the Lord for him to redeem you of that to become brutally honest, to repent so that you can get unstuck and move through. Because in every circumst uh, circumstance of our life, we know that God is working for us. He's working for our welfare, even if ostensibly it looks terrible and it's very challenging. We trust in God's goodness. God is good. We're looking at the sting of bitterness 
uh, today and how that affects even people who love God, even people who are following God. And for uh, the message, I've chosen to look at Naomi, Naomi and Ruth. Naomi uh, was a, a child of God. She was married to a man named Imelech, and they lived in Bethlehem. And there was a great famine that came into Bethlehem at her time. Uh, and this was in the days of the judges. And if you read the book of Judges, you'll find out that during the, this time period, the people did what was right in their own eyes. So that's very important. Many times, even today, as a Christian, we do what is right in our own eyes. We're not doing what is right or righteous in the eyes of the Lord because his ways are not our ways. So Imelech, during this time period, he thought it was best to uproot his family and to move to Moab, which means fields. He was a farmer and he thought, well, hey, look, I'm, we've got a famine here in Bethlehem, in my hometown. I'm going to move. But he went to a foreign place. He actually went to a pagan place uh, and he took his wife. He had two sons. Uh, once he got to Moab, he died. And so he left his two sons and his wife uh, w without without that protection. Okay. And so that was pretty bad. I mean, to be left a widow. But on top of that, both her sons died as well. And their names was Malon and Kilion. Now, they had both married, and they had both married Moabite women. So here we have the story set up. They've left their place of familiarity where they grew up, where they have their um, family, where they have their spiritual family, uh, where they're moving in uh, the fellowship of the Lord with their neighbors. So it wasn't something that was a wise thing to do. But at the time, Amalek thought it was wise. And I'm sure he had good motives. He was wanting to protect his family and, and to provide for his family. But many times, even today, we will move out of the will of God. We will move even out of the kingdom uh, instead of following and seeking the kingdom. Jesus made it clear we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then what? All things will be added to us. So many times we get that out of order, and we look at the what the world has to offer, and we move in a way that the world would move, and it doesn't have good consequences for us. So here we have this situation, a widow now who's also uh, is sonless. Uh, she no longer has even her children to take care of her in her old age. And so she decides to co go back to Bethlehem. And that was a very good choice for her to return, to return to the, the land of her forefathers uh, and really the land of Judah which, of course, we know Judah is the tribe of Jesus, and Imelech was of that tribe as well. She had some land and there, and her intention was to eventually sell it because she was in such dire straits. And she looked at her daughter-in-laws, who were Orpah and Ruth, and she really made the point of, you need to go back to your mother's tent. You need to go back to where you have been loved where you have been re reared. I'm doing that. You need to do the same thing. There's nothing I can do for you girls. I can't have another son for you. Uh, you still, she's really painting the picture. Go on back and maybe things will get better for you and you can remarry. You, that's what is suggested in how she is so adamant in, in telling them to go back. Now, eventually, um, Orpah went back, but in the beginning, both of them clung to Naomi, uh, their mother-in-law, and wanted to go with Naomi. But Naomi made it really clear that they needed to go back. And eventually, Orpah did go back. But the interesting thing about Ruth is she clung to Naomi, and she said, your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. So at that time, we can see that Ruth embraced the only true God. And I can say 
uh, that that had to come through her relationship with Naomi as well as Emilet, the, the brief relationship she had with him, or she may not have even had a relationship with him, but even with her husband, Malon. So we can see how the presence of God, even in this dark time, was still with Naomi because Ruth was willing to leave all she'd ever known, her homeland, everything, to go with Naomi and to choose the true God as her God. So we pick it up in Ruth 1, 19 to 21. Now, I want you to look specifically at Naomi. Here we have Naomi, who, whose name means sweetness, uh, means pleasantness. So she probably had a very sweet uh, nature, a very pleasant nature. Uh, names, I know people think that people are named arbitrarily. I believe God is in naming your children, even though you may not realize it. There are names that seem to characterize who you are, even as you grow older. But let's look at Naomi, Naomi and how bitterness has set into her. So here we see both Ruth and Naomi. They're going back to Bethlehem in Ruth 1, 19 through 21. So both of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. We know Bethlehem is the birthplace of Jesus Christ. That's significant. When they entered Bethlehem, the whole town was excited about them. So they were welcome. They had a homecoming. Uh, they had a welcome parade. But it's interesting because the women said, this can't be Naomi, can it? The women asked. So Naomi didn't look the same as she did when she left Bethlehem. Now, they'd been gone at least 10 years. So I know uh, she had aged somewhat, but I don't think it was just her physical aging that they looked at and said, this can't be Naomi. I think it was more about the attitude she was carrying. The countenance that she had had changed. Verse 20, she answered them, don't call me Naomi. Now, this is the key here. Naomi, which means sweet, call me Mara. And Mara means bitter. Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Now, this was not a true statement. But it was true to her at the time she spoke it. And many times, you and I, when we go through challenging times, bitter times, we will speak things of God that are not true. They're coming out of a heart that's bitter. We can get easily twisted by things that can happen to us in the natural. And we can rail against God. And we can say, God's punished me. God's done this to me. And we can blame God for these things and God is not at the root of these things much of what happens to us I'm not going to say everything that happens to us but much of what happens to us can be related to decisions that we have made apart from the leadership of the Holy Spirit so she says to, uh, to these women the Lord has made my life bitter so you know when you're a bitter person and particularly when you believe the Lord has made your life bitter, you're going to change. Your attitude's going to change. Your countenance will change. And you'll be speaking things that will be prolonged. They will come to pass. Your life will not get any sweeter. It will actually become more bitter. Verse 21, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. That's not true either because the Lord bring did bring her back, but she was not brought back empty. Who was with her? Ruth was with, was with her. So in this passage, w we see the bitterness of Na A Amy talking. Many times we, we think the Bible's perfect and the people in the Bible were perfect. You know, these people love God, but they had great imperfections. Of course, they didn't have the Holy Ghost, but they did know the true God. And it's even the same today. We know Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit. But because of that bitter bite of that scorpion of evil that brings trial tribulation in this world, we can get twisted as well. 
And even if we do speak something that is untrue toward God, the Lord is loving and compassionate, and he's very merciful. And we have to remember that even in the depths of our despair, God is working it out good for us if we love him and are called according to his purpose. Naomi did love God, and she was called according to his purpose. And the Lord put it on the heart of Ruth to come with her. And really, Ruth was part of the way God was going to work in Naomi's life to turn the bitterness of widowhood, the death of her sons too, into great sweetness. Going on, she says, Why do you call me Naomi when the Lord has tormented me and the Almighty has done evil to me? The Lord had not done evil to them. The Lord had not truly tormented uh, them. But she spoke it. And why did she speak it? Because of the bitterness of her heart. When you know truly the fullness, the fullness of the love of God, and you soak in the love of God, and you know him through his son, Jesus Christ, which Naomi, of course, did not have that blessing at that time. You, you, you could never say that the Lord has caused this to torment me. The scripture uh, tells us in Lamentations 3 that the Lord does not willingly uh, bring torment or grief on, on people. That's, that's not his will. Now, do, are we tormented? Life can torment us. Death, certainly, which is the last enemy that is going to be conquered. That can be very tormenting, especially when it's unexpected. So you see, Ruth had that sting of the scorpion. She was going through a night season. Uh, she never expected that she would lose her husband, Imelech. Uh, actually, they thought they, they were going to Moab temporarily and they were going to come back anyway to Bethlehem but she had no idea that he was going to die in Moab and of course we don't know the situations of his death we have no idea and then to lose her two boys to boot very unexpected to see young people die like that when we are challenged by unexpected things that is when we're most vulnerable to being bitter and to begin to blame God for things and get twisted in our heart and mind toward who the Lord is. Now, there's a there's much more in in the in the book of Ruth, but it it really is all about how God has taken a terrible situation and He's turned it uh, to good. He's taken a bitter situation and through people He's made it sweet. When um, after a while, when they had come back to Bethlehem, Ruth married a kinsman of Imelech. His name was Boaz. And God blessed Ruth uh, with a son. And so picking up in Ruth uh, 4, 13, then Boaz took Ruth home and she became his wife. She gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise the Lord who has remembered today to give you someone who will care, take care of you. How beautiful is that? They're speaking. Your grandson is going to grow up and he's going to take care of you. He's going to be your guardian. You know, just as in a way, Naomi became Ruth's guardian temporarily, Ruth then became uh, Naomi's guardian because she married Boaz and when Boaz married Ruth Boaz took over the protection the livelihood the welfare of Naomi and Boaz was a very wealthy man so she went from being a destitute widow to being well taken care of just like Jesus said if you seek for you know, first my kingdom, if you believe in my kingdom and you believe in the righteousness of God and you move righteously in your life, all these things that you need will be what? They will be provided for you. So did God turn the bitter waters in Naomi's life to sweet? She said she called herself Mora. And we know that the Israelites, when they came out of Egypt, they were walking through the desert and they saw an oasis 
and they ran to it because they were so thirsty and they started drinking the water. The water was so dirty. It was so bitter. They were not able to drink it. And they called the spring there Mara. And we know they were very bitter because they didn't believe the Lord could turn it around for them. Uh, but even in that situation, Moses asked the Lord what to do. And the Lord said, you know, throw this tree into the water, into the spring. And the, the tree, which represents Jesus Christ, you know, that we know that Jesus died on a tree, on a cross. He, he listened and obeyed God, did what God told him to do. And miraculously, the dirty, the bitter water became sweet. And they were able to drink. But later on, if you continue to read that, they moved from ba uh, from Mara to a place called Elam, Elam, which means fruitfulness, fruitfulness. So I want to say to you, you grow when you're challenged, even when you go through situations that have the propensity to cause you to be bitter. But if you'll keep your faith and you will trust in the Lord, you'll not lean to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. The Lord will direct your paths and he will bring you into a place of fruitfulness. Do not allow bitterness to rob you of the fruitfulness that God wants to give you in this life because we all go through struggles. We're all going through ordeals. Don't blame God for it, but trust God through it. And you will see like like Ruth and Naomi s saw the goodness of the Lord. And then they go on to say. The child's name, which is Obed, the child's name will be famous in Israel. He will bring you a new life and support you where in your old age. So good. Your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons because she has given birth. Naomi said she came back from Moab empty, but she couldn't see at that time. Her eyes were blinded to the goodness of God. All along, God was working and God was working in her favor. Now, it took time for all the things to fall out. And sometimes we have to sit still and let things fall out and believe that things will fall out for our good. So Naomi took the child, held him on her lap and became his guardian. The women in the neighborhood said, Naomi has a son. So they gave him the name Obed, which means servant of God or worshiper of God. He became the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. So here we have Obed. He is the what? The grandfather of the greatest king of Israel, David. And we know that Jesus is called the son of David. The point I'm making is the Lord had arranged all this, orchestrated all this so that Jesus Christ's lineage would come through this. All of this uh, moving and changing came through the obedience of of Ruth obeying Naomi. Naomi told her what to do as versus Boaz. She was obedient to Naomi because she trusted in the God that Naomi trusted in. Boaz married Ruth and they had a son. And how wonderful is that? Because his name, Obed, is written in the lineage of Jesus Christ. So in the end, everything turned out beautifully. They left Bethlehem, but they came back to Bethlehem. And Jesus the Christ would come later on down the line and be born in Bethlehem. You know, you really can't make this stuff up. The depths of the glory of God, the wisdom of God is past our knowing. His ways really are past our understanding. That's why we have to trust God in situations that could bring us down, make us cold, and make us bitter. Remember Romans 8, 28. Don't ever forget this. And we know, and you have to know it, that for those, be in those, not in them, and we know that for those who love God, number one, 
all things work together for good and for those who are called according to his purpose. All of the pain that Naomi bore, all of the pain that Ruth bore, their pain propelled them to a powerful purpose. And one of those purposes was to see Jesus Christ born through their lineage. That's very powerful. And it would be something that we need to look at our life and to say, Lord, the pain that I'm going through, I'm just going to trust you through it because I'm called to your purposes and I love you. And I know that the end of a thing is better than the beginning. And you're going to move me through this by your grace and by your love. And it's going to come out better than what I could ever think or even imagine. Can you get there, beloved? Can you stay there, beloved? Can you confess that, beloved? And you, and you need to do this. Don't let the enemy in this month steal the goodness of God from you in anything that might happen, any disappointment or something that's happened in the past that is continually trying to zap your strength, your joy, your peace. Jeremiah 29, 11, very famous passage. I'm sure you know it. Prophet Jeremiah is speaking through the Holy Spirit here. For I know the plans I have for you. God is speaking. And God knows the plans that he has for you. Sometimes your plan, my plan, is not necessarily God's plan. And our plans sometimes can really get us in deep hot water. They can get us off track. But just as they can get us off track, when we turn to the Lord and we trust that his plans are, are for us, we can get back on track. Sometimes our plans have to die in order that God's plans for us can live. Amen? And we go through certain things so that our eyes can open to that truth. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil. So the Lord's not up to evil in your life. God is up to something good in your life and to give you a future and a hope. Beloved, this month, though it may be bitter, the cold nights are coming. Let it be that no matter what comes, what, no matter what has come prior, you're going to deal with any bitter root. You're going to stay very, very hot for the Lord, zealous for his good works, knowing that he loves you, he's for you. And any bitter root that you might have in your heart will be pulled up as you ask the Lord Jesus to do that, to make you zealous for his kingdom and for his works. Now, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you, give you favor. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.